trotted out at the beginning, Muslims are not disproportionately likely to commit acts of violence against civilians. The facts are just against that. Uh, and that similarly, the leaders of the religion are speaking out against uh, this craziness. A lot of the prejudice, I think, can be overcome. But um, it's going to be an uphill struggle. Remember, two years ago, when Prospect magazine, which likes to think that it knows everything, did a global survey to find out who are the leading intellectuals in today's world. And people from around the world responded. Uh, and number one was Fethullah Gulen. In the Muslim world, that was not regarded as surprising, but David Goodhart, the editor of Prospect magazine, admitted that he'd never heard of him. And that's an indication of the problem that we face. People in the West simply don't know how Islam is constructed, who speaks for Islam. They've heard of the man with the hook in Finsbury Park. They've heard of the man with the beard in the caves of Afghanistan. That's it. They don't know who speaks for the religion. And that's why we're getting this perception that the religion itself is somehow implicated in the actions of this tiny a uh, tiny percentage of people who are engaged in forms of bavi and hiraba. Anyway, um, I've been given a great, generous amount of time and I'm grateful, but um, can I stop at this point and yeah, we okay. open this up to questions? Thank you very much. Okay, okay. we we'll start with yeah. Yeah. Dr. Murad. Thank you so much uh, for a great talk. I have two questions for you. Uh, my first question is that if in a state um, Muslims are being persecuted, like in India and in Israel, mm -hmm. um, would a war or jihad against those states be offensive or defensive uh, if a Muslim state chooses to do so? And my second question is, the resistance, the present resistance in <coughs> Iran and Afghanistan against the invading armies. Do you consider that as a valid jihad? Well, in the, in the context of your first question, the, the law books can't really define <coughs> the point at which one has to intervene to protect people in a neighboring state, because every situation is going to have its own complexities. Um, in the case of... Uh, uh, in most cases, they will say that Muslims have the duty of obedience to a state um, unless they're actually f uh, prevented from performing the basic obligations. If they're punished for praying five times a day, they're not allowed to fast in Ramadan, then their obedience to the state lapses in that case. And there are analogous debates, for instance, in the Jewish community in the 1930s, how bad do things have to get before we're no longer loyal German citizens and we have to disobey these laws? And everybody has to define where that boundary is at, at, at some point. Um, there are plenty of places in the world where Islam is repressed in subtle ways. There aren't many places where one is actively prevented from praying. You can be discriminated against if you're in Tunisia, for instance, and you want to pray five times a day, you're unlikely to get a good job in the government. And the, plenty of places like that. That's not quite the same as the practice itself being outlawed in, in the country. And generally, the Sunni position is always to err on the side of caution. Sunnism, uh, as expressed by the Ghazali, Razi, the great theorists, will generally oppose any khuruj or coming out uh, against the, the authorities. Um, it's been accused by some radicals as being rather quietistic, that you just um, pray for better times and work for an improvement of the situation uh, using peaceful means. But in Palestine, the, uh, the Palestinian people were driven out from their land mm -hmm. to the first wave. Yeah. Um, now that expelling people from their homes, uh, that is sort of similar to what happened in Malta, right. when Muslims were mm -hmm. pretty much expelled from, from, from the city. E yes, but the parallel breaks down when you look at the form of resistance. Uh, well, the Muslims who were driven out of Mecca didn't immediately say, well, I should go back into the bazaar in Mecca and start stabbing people at random, which is, would be the equivalent of suicide bombing. That would have been completely alien. They had an idea of chivalry, and you target the combatants, and the women and the children are sacrosanct. So the great tragedy of the, the Palestinian debacle has been that even though the Palestinians clearly have gigantically strong moral case, and you certainly don't have to be Muslim to see that, they've really let themselves down very badly 
by engaging in the targeting of civilians and other practices that has delegitimized them, not just in the eyes of the world, but in the eyes of traditional Sharia scholarship. That doesn't mean that people who are persecuted, driven out of their homes, don't have and shouldn't have the right to self-defense, because that's the beginning of the UN Charter starts with that. Peoples have the right to self-defense. Palestinians should have the right to self-defense. But the targeting of civilians is an aberration. That's where Hiraba begins. And from a theological point of view, one could probably say, until they stop doing that, then they're not going to get any support from on high, which is my suspicion. I think that they have to sort themselves out before any kind of new horizon is manifested to them. They've dug themselves into a very, very deep psychic hole uh, by validating these practices, which are clearly offensive and unacceptable. I agree with, uh, with that, uh, the attacks on Sudan and the suicide bombing in that context has nothing to do with Islam. It's, it's rather, I believe, it's a reflection of the, it's a human, un-Islamic response to, to the sufferings they have suffered. It's pretty much how, Jeff, uh, how in Sri Lanka, the Tamil people, they started killing people yep. after they were treated very harshly by the government there. Yeah, but um, the measure of people's religious quality is how they behave when they're in intolerable circumstances. Okay. Should we take another question? Yeah? Sorry. No. Thank you for that um, fascinating talk. And um, it's nice to hear a talk which attempts to historicize um, the Islamic tradition as well, rather than just talking about contemporary politics. Um, and, I, and just on that note, um, when I've read some of the Syria, some of the things I've had a problem with. Um, just, just understanding the morality have been the battles that took place in the Medina period. And, and two other things which I wonder whether you could comment on. One is the, um, the, the raiding on the, the camel chains that came mm -hmm. um, from, from Mecca. And another is the, um, the relationship between the Muslims in Medina and the Bank Khreza. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. um, and, and kind of the events that took place there and mm -hmm. kind of a problem trying to understand what actually happened or the morality behind it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Well, it, it, war is always an ugly business, and um, the Muslims in Medina were faced with complete ethnic cleansing and destruction. The Bani Qurayza case was the decision, uh, not the Prophet's decision, but the decision of Sa'ad bin Mu'adh, who was the judge who had been approved by the Bani Qurayza themselves, uh, and the Prophet agreed to abide by the ruling that he gave, uh, and that was made explicit. So that was Sa'ad bin Mu'adh's uh, responsibility. But um, the overall picture really is the one I indicated, that maybe a thousand people died altogether in bringing peace to a region that had been fighting these tribal vendettas uh, for thousands of years. That ultimately is, from the point of view of just war theory, which looks at the, the price to be paid and the potential benefit, um, the, the way that has to be the way that it has to be assessed. But um, in, in any war, you can find things that, with the benefit of hindsight and looking at it from the point of view of a kind of centrally heated armchair hundreds of years later, you say, oh, I wouldn't have done that, but you're not in that situation. You have to remember what this country did when its back was up against the wall in the Second World War. What did Churchill call the area bombing of German cities? He called it terror bombing. 600,000 <coughs> civilians died. And nowadays, we're kind of freaked out by that. At the time, it seemed like the right decision. And uh, from a certain perspective, tough decisions taken in war, um, if they have a positive outcome that uh, brings peace and justice, are justified. And from a distance, from our comfortable situation, we can moralize. But um, it's the outcome that, that, that is the vindication. OK. Um, the gentleman. Yes, uh, you spoke a bit about that there is even for Muslims it's kind of a mess of who speaks with the name of Islam. Mm -hmm. And you even you know, mentioned, for example, the Mukta regions. Yep. A lot of people argue that mm -hmm. there's complete credibility with the masses. Mm -hmm. So I would like to hear your perspective of A, who actually speaks with the name of Islam, mm -hmm. B, of how can we sort out this mess? Mm -hmm. Well, those who speak for the religion aren't people who, as in the Western Christian context, are part of a hierarchy that administers sacraments. So you know that the Pope speaks for Catholicism. But neither is it a democratic system whereby whoever happens to be the most popular scholar is the one who represents the religion and the tradition, because Islam is 